October was a month of truly bleak climate news. In a series of reports, climate scientists across the world raised the alarm about the critical need for real action before we enter a totally catastrophic and irreversible stage of climate change. Just a week ago, the UN Environment Programme released some damning findings in its latest report, the Emissions Gap Report. It found that governments would have to cut greenhouse gases drastically by 57% by 2035 to slow the global temperature rise to 1.5 degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels. If current policies continue, the UN Emissions Gap Report says, the world is on course for warming of 3.1 degrees Celsius in annual global temperatures over the course of this century. That's a catastrophic level of warming that could see the collapse of rainforests, coral reefs and fish stocks. The UN report tells the world climate crunch time is here. The United Nations Secretary General, Antonio Guterres, added his voice to the report, attempting to encapsulate how precarious humanity is. We are teetering on a planetary tightrope. Either leaders bridge the emissions gap or we plunge headlong into climate disaster. The report issued yet another warning to the nations of the world to amp up their plan to hit climate targets and to do it fast. The world media briefly paid attention. We are way off target when it comes to how dire things well, are. Is that is a what wide you... gap between climate action promised by countries and their results. The UN has warned the world is on track for what it calls a catastrophic. And then nothing. There is no new policy and so far no change in global conversations. The world's media and its audiences just moved on to the next story. In fact, most people likely didn't know about the report at all. A lot of us have switched off and tuned out. In fact, some experts say climate apathy rather than climate denialism is now the bigger threat to climate action. So the question is, how do we tell people the planet is in trouble if nobody listens? I am Grace Jennings Edquist. You're listening to Leave It to the Experts. Before we get to how we tackle the resistance to climate change reporting, first, we should arm ourselves with the latest facts about the threats we're facing. On Monday, a new report from the World Meteorological Organization revealed that greenhouse gas levels globally surged to a new record in 2023. That report, which is called the Annual Greenhouse Gas Bulletin, found the world is off track in its aim to limit global warming to well below 2 degrees Celsius, and it's nowhere near its aim of ideally limiting warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels. Now, a quick refresher here. Limiting how hot the world gets is the central aim of the Paris Agreement on Climate Change. And that's what many of the nations of the world signed up to at the Paris Climate Summit in 2015. The Paris Agreement is a legally binding international treaty on climate change. To limit global warming to well below 2, preferably to 1.5 degrees Celsius, then, just yesterday, the new State of the Climate report was released by Australia's National Science Agency, CSIRO, and the Bureau of Meteorology. That report revealed that Australia's average temperature has already increased by more than 1.5 degrees Celsius since national records began. That Australian report follows hot on the heels of a global State of the Climate report, which is released by a separate team of international scientists, led by two researchers from Oregon in the US. That report warned that the world is now entering a critical and unpredictable stage of climate emergency. As the authors wrote, we are on the brink of an irreversible climate disaster. This is a global emergency beyond any doubt. This US-led report makes clear that despite warnings over half a century, we're still moving in the wrong direction. Fossil fuel emissions have increased to an all-time high. The three hottest days ever occurred in July of 2024. In other words, all these climate reports agreed the world is on track to blow right past the Paris Agreement's target of limiting the global temperature increase to 1.5 degrees above pre-industrial levels. And the window to avert the world passing that marker is narrowing quickly. The World Meteorological Organization says there's a 66% chance that the world will surpass that 1.5 degrees Celsius marker within the next five years. So by now, we're pretty clear on the fact that the world is facing a climate crisis. But what do these impacts actually look like? Let's zoom in on Australia as a case study to take a closer look. Australia's biannual State of the Climate report, the one released yesterday, warns that Australia's sea levels are rising, the number of snow days is decreasing, and the nation's rainfall is becoming more extreme. Marine heat waves are leading to mass bleaching events which affect reefs, including the iconic Great Barrier Reef. 
These are just some of the headline issues, so let's get more analysis from CSIRO itself. Dr Jackie Brown is the Research Director for the Climate Intelligence Program and the lead of CSIRO's Climate Science Centre. Hi, Dr Jackie Brown. Thanks so much for joining us today. What are some of the key takeaway messages from this year's State of the Climate Report, please? There's a lot in the report, but there's probably five things I'd focus on. Warming. We all know it's getting warmer. Uh, 2023 was the warmest year globally, and eight of the nine hottest years have happened since 2013. So continuing to see those temperatures increase. 2023 was not only the hottest globally, but it was the year that we had the largest bushfires across Australia. And as we go into the future, those warmer, drier conditions will mean more fire weather days will happen. But while we have drying trends, when it does rain, the rainfall is more extreme. So we're seeing more heavy rainfall events. So when it does rain, a lot more water in that rainfall, which of course can lead to flooding. And then there's the oceans. The oceans are getting warmer. That means marine heat waves, which is putting pressure on our coral reefs. Uh, the sea levels are rising. So a lot of things to consider that are already happening and will continue to happen into the future. Australia is facing one of the hottest summers on record, where the modelling shows. Can you tell me just a little bit more about what Australians can expect this summer, including perhaps like what bushfire risk is looking like? So Australia has hotter and cooler summers related to El Nino and La Nina, and that will always happen. But what we need to take into account now is there's a warming trend. So the summers of the future will be on average warmer than summers of the past. So hotter, drier conditions, and that will always mean a greater exposure to bushfire risk. Because we have that cycle of wet and cool and warm and dry, the wet, cool years build up uh, the amount of stuff that can burn. So when we do get the drier years, that's why we have more dangerous bushfires, for example, in 2023. I want to move on to talk about our oceans because I'm interested in hearing how about how marine heat waves are predicted to increase and also last longer than they used to. So how will these marine heat waves impact Australia's coral reefs, including obviously the Great Barrier Reef? So the frequency and extent of marine heat waves has been increasing since 1970, and we see that happen down the east coast and west coast of Australia in particular. Uh, when we see the warmer events, that puts a lot of stress on the coral reefs, and sometimes they can recover. But as the marine heat waves get more intense and longer, that's a lot more pressure. Uh, and less chance to recover. And, and that's the real concern. What happens when those the marine heat wave events occur put too much stress on the Great Barrier Reef and it can't recover? Uh, there's been a big pressure on this year and we're waiting to see the outcome of that. Thanks for explaining that. Uh, I did want to talk about tropical cyclones because they can be associated with warmer oceans. And look, this is a timely topic because I understand Australian cyclone season technically begins in November. Are we likely to see more tropical cyclones in coming years or perhaps just more severe ones than we usually see? The pattern of tropical cyclones is harder to understand because we don't have a lot each year, unlike you know, marine heat waves or temperature change, there's a lot of data. But what we do expect to see with tropical cyclones is less of them but more intensity, so stronger tropical cyclones coming through that maybe not quite as often. Okay, thanks so much for explaining that. I want to talk about rain just briefly, as we did touch on it before. So I understand heavy rainfall is has been over time becoming more intense in some parts of the country, and then elsewhere there's been declines in rainfall. So just in a nutshell, where are we seeing these different scenarios and what kind of challenges do both of those scenarios present? The future of our rainfall can seem a bit contradictory because it's going to get drier and wetter. So we've got conditions, particularly through the southwest and southeast, that are getting drier through the wet season or winter, and that's a, a longer-term trend. And that in particular puts pressure on our farming communities that rely on that winter rainfall. So drying conditions through the south, but what we're seeing is when it does rain, that rainfall becomes more intense. We'll be right back. Hi, my name is Andrew Jaspin, and I'm the founding editor and director of 360 Info. At 360 Info, we're providing evidence-driven, solution-based journalism, all written by leading experts. Every week, we release new and innovative news content that bridges the gap between the world's brightest minds and the global public. To be part of the fight against misinformation, 
sign up for our newsletters and follow us on social media or head to 360info.org. If you're a journalist or a publisher or editor, you can sign up for our Newswire service, which is free of charge at newshub.360info.org. There are solutions to all this, climate scientists are saying. Let's hear from Nerali Abram from the Australian National University. She's a professor of climate science. She's also deputy director of the Australian Centre for Excellence in Antarctic Science and the Centre of Excellence for the Weather of the 21st Century. The state of the climate reports don't generally focus on solutions. They report more on key observations, analyses and projections. So what are some of the key solutions to mitigating the worst impacts of climate change? Uh, there's really only one assured solution, and that is to reduce greenhouse gas emissions um, and to reach net zero. And by reaching net zero, we'll get to a point where we can stabilise uh, climate. Other critical ways to mitigate the worst effects of climate change include driving down methane emissions and reducing waste and overconsumption, according to the US-led Global State of the Climate Report. So are these key three things really likely to happen and how relevant are they to the Australian context? I asked Dr Lucy Richardson. She's the Deputy Director of the Climate Change Communication Research Hub at Monash University. A lot of these kinds of approaches could be implemented in Australia and some of them have actually been tested here in the past. Um, with our political narratives being so polarised, I do wonder how many people even know just how successful our carbon pollution reduction scheme was. Um, for those listeners who don't remember that scheme, it was actually better known at the time as the carbon tax, but it was actually quite effective at reducing emissions without negatively impacting on our economy at the time. So we have had some success in that, but that political um, polarisation meant that that um, was discontinued. And um, most of the commentary that I'm seeing at the moment doesn't appear to see this kind of intervention as being put in place here in the near future. But, but it will be interesting to see, for example, how the, the uh, Australian Energy Market Commission's new uh, shadow price uh, on um, uh, is coming into play and what that might mean for the policy decisions and energy emissions in the future. I also wanted to hear more from Professor Abram. So I asked her how far off we are from actually reducing fossil fuel emissions down to an acceptable level. So we, we know what we need to do. Uh, we know sort of how much carbon we can still afford to burn and stay within uh, different levels of climate warming. Uh, we have the technology to be able to do that transformation. Uh, where the hurdle is at the moment is how quickly we're deploying that and transforming um, our societies and our economies to decarbonise them. So uh, at the moment, we're seeing a levelling off of um, global emissions, but what we need is actually to reduce those emissions, emissions um, down rapidly and getting to, to net zero. So we haven't actually started that downward journey yet. Thanks for explaining that. Uh, obviously, your answer focused on this really big picture stuff about um, governments, countries, um, which and also, I suppose, big corporates really reducing their emissions. Um, sometimes people like to talk about solutions at the individual level. Um, there's a lot of kind of articles around about what you as an individual or family can do to reduce emissions and contribute and play your part. Do you think that when talking about solutions to climate change, is it at all helpful to talk about this individual piece of the puzzle um, or really do we need to be making sure that we're focusing on governments um, and big companies or are both perhaps important for different reasons? Um, I would say that both are important for different reasons. So if we're going to actually make meaningful and rapid and lasting um, emission reductions, that has to be driven by um, corporations and by government putting in place the policy settings that will actually drive us in that direction. Uh, but at the same time, this is an enormous problem. Um, everybody is part of um, contributing to greenhouse gas emissions, uh, and everybody is affected by the impacts of climate change. Um, and so in terms of um, the sense of agency as opposed to despair, um, when we're thinking about climate change and what it's going to take to actually solve this problem, actually having those individual actions can help to bring people into the um, feeling like they're actually part of the, the solution. Uh, but we can't afford to make um, the the burden of the solution fall on individuals. Um, that would be something that um, just delays the actual major action that needs to happen um, in terms of the big picture transformation that we need for society. Um, and so 
Uh, we need both, uh, but absolutely the priority needs to be on reducing emissions where the majority of emissions are, are happening um, and having the government policy settings in place to drive that transformation. Professor Abram also told me there's a widespread misconception that might be adding to a level of complacency around climate action. I would say that probably um, the the most important misconception at the moment is that I think people think that we're already solving this problem, um, that we're, we're seeing... Um, lots of solar panels going on rooftops. We're solving this problem, uh, and 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 we are making those positive steps forward. And that has meant that we're getting to a point where we're stabilising how much we're emitting in terms of greenhouse gases each year. But what that means is that we are still at the point where we are making climate change worse every year by the greatest amount that we ever have. We're still at the the worst points that we've ever been at in terms of this problem. Uh, and so I think that there's a misconception that we really need to um, make sure that people are aware of that um, climate change isn't just about, and then solving climate change isn't about stabilising um, emissions where we're currently at. It's about actually reducing emissions and getting to net zero. And that's um, a very long path ahead of us, um, but we need to take that path as quickly as we can um, to um, avoid the, the worst uh, potential impacts of climate change. So what's next? In terms of actually tackling the climate crisis, what might happen next at the global level? Crucially, world leaders will meet next month at the UN's climate change conference in Baku, Azerbaijan. But it remains to be seen whether COP29 will produce many substantial changes. Certainly last year's UN climate change conference drew criticism. That conference produced a final, arguably quite vague agreement to transition away from fossil fuels instead of a really clear commitment to urgently phase out fossil fuels. And critics pointed out that this agreement, in fact, leaves room for the continued expansion of fossil fuels potentially. So ultimately, COP28's draft deal to cut f global fossil fuel production was slammed as grossly insufficient by some. And relatedly, last year's conference, COP28, attracted almost 2,500 fossil fuel lobbyists they actually outnumbered nearly all individual country delegations. This brings us back to the central question of this episode. Why doesn't it feel like anyone is really acting on climate scientists' warnings that we're on the brink of total climate disaster? Why do the grim warnings in these reports on their own not shift the needle on the way our policies are made and our futures shaped? Well, first, the political and economic forces at play can't be understated. In Australia, to take one example, the use of fossil fuels and the resistance to alternative energy production due to increased prices is just one element where the political and economic merges with our climate reality. Stephen Miles has approved two new coal mines in just the past couple of weeks. These two coal mines will generate a massive 594 million tonnes of greenhouse gas emissions. 150 hectares of koala habitat will be cleared to make way for one of three coal mine expansions. Australia remains one of the world's largest climate polluters. As the new State of the Climate report highlighted, Australia is a big fossil fuel exporter. It sent more than twice as much carbon dioxide overseas as it burned at home between 2010 and 2019. So despite the fact Australia only produces 1.1% of the global carbon emissions for domestic use for things like coal-fired power plants and gas generation, it is, according to research, the second largest climate polluter when calculated by total carbon emissions from its massive fossil fuel exports eaten only by Russia. It is this contradiction that makes Australia such a unique proposition in the fight against climate change. Its economy and the support for its high living standards relies upon fossil fuel production and things that help accelerate climate change. But in the long term, financially, this makes Australia a volatile venture. Put simply, quite apart from the catastrophic impacts on our environment, climate change threatens Australia's jobs and economy. So purely from an economic standpoint, the past few years have seen horrendous examples of that playing out. Take, for example, the bushfires of 2019 to 2020. It's claimed Australia lost $2.8 billion in total output and nearly 7,300 jobs. Or the extreme floods that swept southeast Queensland and New South Wales in the first half of 2022, they're believed to have wiped away $3.35 billion in insured losses, according to an industry report. Australia is in the grip of a relentless flood emergency. I would have thought you'd get this once in a lifetime, not three times in 15 months. 
A recent report says that with climate change on the march, more than two-thirds of Australians' tourism sites could be wiped off the map. That would cost billions of dollars and tens of thousands of jobs. However, let's not forget the big picture. This is, of course, about far more than economics. Australia is uniquely vulnerable to climate change. The states of Victoria, New South Wales and Queensland are among the top 10% of global jurisdiction most at risk from the physical effects of climate change, one report has found. And last year, a record 130 species were added to the threatened species list in Australia, while populations of already listed species continue to decline. And as we heard from CSIRO's Dr Jackie Brown earlier, things are only going to get worse. So what are you supposed to do with that information? Let's hear again from Dr Lucy Richardson from Monash University. How do audiences tend to respond psychologically and behaviourally perhaps to reports about climate change and its worsening effects? People can respond in a variety of ways. Um, The worry and the fear that are associated with these worsening impacts can really lead people to feel overwhelmed. And for some people, this means they actually disengage from the issue as a way to cope with those overwhelming feelings. If we feel like we can make a difference, though, that worry and that fear can actually be motivating and really push us into action as a way to cope with those emotions. Um, But there are also other people who may feel that addressing climate change will cause them more harm than they think climate change will. And so these people in this situation, typically they're in wealthier countries, um, like Australia, for example, and they fall somewhere on a spectrum of denial, either consciously or unconsciously, they might uh, come up with ways to mitigate that perceived risk. And a small number of these have been those really loud voices of denial that we've heard in recent decades. But others may be convinced that the changes are natural and so they don't require action or they may just think that it's not going to be as bad as people say. I wanted to ask about climate apathy. So for some news consumers... Uh, Do you think there is this element of apathy, like I can't personally change anything, so I'm just going to switch off or tune out? And if so, how much of a threat is that sort of apathy? Yeah, it's certainly a risk, but it's not actually always about apathy. Here in Australia, most of our population live in cities. And because of that, we're somewhat insulated from climate change's worst impacts. And with the distractions of everyday life, it could just be that we just don't think about it. Um, But on the other hand, there are also people who are worried about climate change and want to see change, but maybe they don't know that they can do it within their limitations. Um, So they might not have the money or the time or et cetera, um, or the infrastructure nearby, or maybe they don't realise just how many people are already acting. And so they think that their actions won't make a difference. Um, or, Or maybe they actually don't know which actions would have the greatest impact. So they don't know where to start, or they don't know um, that what they do will make a difference, to know if that makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. It does make sense. And I'm glad you raised that because I wanted to go on and talk about actions that make a difference or potential solutions. So in a nutshell, a huge question, um, but what are, what are some of the key solutions to mitigating the worst impacts of climate change, do you think? Yeah, as most people would know, you know, one of the most impactful things that we can do as a society is stop using coal, oil and natural gas for generating our electricity. Burning those, giving off those those greenhouse gas emissions, that's what's causing the problem. So we need to we need to deal with that. Um, but a lot of the, that and associated actions that can really be done at that policy, government policy, industry level, also scale down to our individual actions. Uh, and so uh, there's some a range of things that people can do there. So some of them are trickier to adopt than others, depending on our situation, as I mentioned before. Um, So things like, for example, buying renewable energy from your electricity provider or installing solar panels and batteries at your home. But people who are renting their house or living in apartments with limited or costly electricity options, they might struggle to do this. Um, There are some local governments, though, that have taken out programs specifically to help people in those situations to actually move to renewable energy. So it's worth people reaching out for that to see what's there. Um, Another key action is reducing our use of fossil uh, fuel burning cars. And this might mean swapping our car trips for walking or cycling or taking public transport. It might mean carpooling or buying an electric car. But this can also be difficult for families, for example, where there might be several morning drop offs on the way to work or not enough money to buy an electric car or no capacity to move closer to work. So um, working from home 
is actually one of the few things that we got um, as a benefit out of COVID. There's not many things that you can say that good coming out of COVID, but that was one. Um, so there can be difficulties there. Um, also our purchasing choices. So we can start by just buying less stuff. Um, since much of what was manu is manufactured is done using that electricity from coal, oil and gas. Uh, we can also hunt out more sustainable brands, but it can sometimes be hard to tell whether they are or aren't or if they just look like they are. Um, and then things like um, reducing the amount of meat that we eat, especially red meat. Um, some people find this tricky and might be because they don't um, don't know what to replace it with from a nutritional sense or because they're unsure um, how much better the alternatives are in terms of their emissions, or maybe they just don't know how to cook the alternatives that are out there. So there's, there's lots of things we could be doing. Um, it depends a lot on our situation. To those listeners who see this report and just feel completely helpless when reading these grim facts in the, this new State of the Climate report, what would you want them to know? You are not alone. It is not too late. There are things you can do and you can make a difference. I think that's probably the prime things. Uh, and also be kind to yourself and to others. We can use this as an opportunity to connect with other people um, rather than to push ourselves apart. Um, guilt and blame, for example, are more likely to shut people down than to encourage them to act. So it's okay to be angry, worried, scared, but use those feelings to push us to reach out, to find other people who want to do similar things, to learn what we need to do to be able to act and to actually get out there and act. I'd love to hear as someone who, you know, you've got great expertise in this space. What do you think is missing from the current conversations in Australia about climate change? You know, do you do you think that we tend to focus on particular issues and really ignore other important ones? I, I guess linking back to one of the points I made earlier, one, one of the key issues I see is the false split in the poli political debate that says, suggests that climate action must necessarily be bad for jobs in the economy. Um, th there's been a little bit of a shift in that in recent years, but it is still there. And climate action can absolutely be good for the economy and for jobs. And if we don't act, that will actually have important implications for jobs that I don't really think are being talked about enough. You mean, you think about our tradies. What will it mean for the construction industry if we have more and more heat waves? Our tradies, they are not going to be up on our roofs on 40 degree days. And if there are more hot days, that's more days oh, without on-site work. Um, the number of hot days above 35 degrees across Australia has doubled since 1960. And as this gets worse, and then we add in the effects of increasing floods and bushfires and hailstorms, et cetera, it's, it could be crippling for the industry and have significant flow on effects for all the other aspects like housing and businesses, energy developments and more. So uh, I, I don't see that that's being discussed anywhere near enough when we're talking about this, um, the, the implications of climate action for jobs and the economy. I also asked Ben Ewell, Professor of Behavioural Science in the School of Psychology at UNSW Sydney, to weigh in. He's also Director of the UNSW Institute for Climate Risk and Response. What do we know about how news consumers respond psychologically and behaviourally to reports about climate change and its worsening effects? Yes, yeah, it's, it's an interesting question. There's a study from uh, the UK in 2022 that looked at this to some extent. So it was a study that was interested in the relationship between people feeling climate anxiety or eco-distress and whether that links to taking action on climate. Uh, and one of the things that they looked at was people's climate change information seeking behavior. So in other words, how often did I look to the news and look to uh, social media or other sources to get information on climate change? And what they found in that study was that uh, there was a clear um, it, was a, it was a predictor of increased climate anxiety or distress was how often I looked for information about climate change in the news. So I think there is a little bit of a link there between um, my desire to find out what's going on in the climate and then my, my heightened levels of concern or anxiety about it. The other thing, though, that that paper found was that it also links then as some predictive um, power, in other words, explains people's willingness to take action on climate change as well. So in other words... The more you're seeking out information on climate change, the more anxious you might feel about climate, but you might also be more likely to then take action. Exactly. So there may be actually a slightly sort of positive effect of being a little bit anxious. I mean, climate anxiety is a, is a term that's becoming more and more used, um, and it's probably getting ahead of its sort of evidential basis. So it's an interesting concept, but it's one that um, anxiety in the clinical li literature is used as quite a, you know, it, it has a 
a clinical defined meaning. Whereas putting the label climate on top of it makes it sound as though it's a sort of pathological condition that maybe needs treatment. But in fact, it's it, it's still an, a developing literature in terms of whether people should consider it as something that can be treated like other sorts of anxiety or whether it's simply a um, uh, reaction uh, to, you know, a, a worry about what's going on, not something that necessarily needs treatment, but something that could have some, uh, be a sort of motivating force for, for action. No, certainly. That's fascinating. Thank you. I was wondering, are, are these responses of um, what we might call climate anxiety and seeking out information, perhaps action as a response, are they any different among particular demographics, different genders and so on, or um, do we not have that information yet? Uh, yeah. So again, there there is that same study from the UK in 2022 did find that another predictor of um, heightened levels of, of concern was age. So younger age groups did seem to show um, a greater concern about climate change and a, and a greater um, uh, then, you know, link to that, that desire to do something. There's also a big study from um, that came out in 2021 um, in The Lancet, which is a big medical journal, which showed that uh, in a sample of about 10,000 young people, uh, so 16 to 25 year olds all across the world, uh, about 70% said that they were worried or were even extremely worried about climate change. So I think there is um, a, some studies are certainly showing evidence that younger age groups are feeling it more. Oh, that's fascinating. I was wondering for some news consumers, are we seeing a lot of, I suppose you could call it climate apathy? So a sense of like, I can't personally change anything. And I've heard this story a thousand times now. So I'm just going to tune out or switch off. Um, and if so, how much of a threat is that to climate action? Yeah, I think again, good, it's a good question. I mean, there the does seem to be the most recent data that I've I've seen shows an overwhelming um, belief that climate change is something that's happening, a, a desire for for action to be taken, whether that be by governments or actually by individuals, um, an overwhelming belief in or, or support for climate action policy. So there's a few large scale studies that have been published in the last year or so uh, that involve you know, 60, 70,000 participants across 60, 70 countries around the world. And that overall like, belief in climate change there is up around 85, 86%. And the support for policy is around 70%. And even, I mean, it's, it's hypothetical, it's sort of willingness to, to support, but people are saying that it, even things like um, supporting policy that would have an impact on their own income. So, you know, basically sacrificing up to 1% of your income to support climate policy, uh, that seems to be gaining um, support as well. Around Again, around sort of 70% of people saying that. But one of the interesting findings in that study is that there's a gap between people's perception of the support in other people and their own level of support. So although in the, in the aggregate, in the whole, it's about 70%, if you ask people, how many people do you think would support that kind of a measure, then it drops down to about 55, 56%. So this sort of perception gap. So I think part of the climate apathy maybe comes from people thinking, oh, well, nobody else is as concerned about it as I am or wants to do the same things that I do. And so I'm going to walk back from it. That isn't to say that there is also evidence that things like feeling that you personally can have a difference, the sort of idea of self-efficacy of my action does also contribute to my willingness to want to take um, action as well. We did some work a few years back that showed that that was a that that belief that what I could do would have an impact was a strong um, predictor of my willingness to to adopt different sort of climate positive behaviours. Important message. Thank you so much for joining us. Really appreciate your time. It's a pleasure. Interestingly, both Dr. Richardson and Dr. Newell have messages of hope. They want everyday people to realise that they're not alone, that there are many people working towards a common goal and that change is possible. But there still remain other challenges that can prevent people from listening to warnings on climate change. One study from September this year found that cost of living pressures might have an impact and income disparities can create challenges in climate policy support. That study, which was led by researchers at the University of Chinese Academy of Sciences Department of Psychology, found that people experiencing income poverty are significantly less likely to support climate policy. These people were more likely to experience climate apathy, 
they tended to prioritise immediate interests over long-term climate concerns. So that's one possible explanation for people not acting on the urgency of all these climate warnings from scientists. Another key factor here is, of course, the media and how people interact with it. People are losing trust in the news media. Study after study has shown it. And the news media is also being absorbed into an attention economy where important stories must compete with entertainment. This is the fault not just of the social media platforms that are incentivized to keep us scrolling with no real regard for what's most worthy of readers' attention, more on that later, but it's also the fault of the broader media industry, which has chased audiences, which in turn brings in advertising dollars, often at the cost of journalistic integrity. As a result of all of this, globally, we're now in a crisis of how we receive and interpret information. And this isn't just with regards to climate change, this is regarding everything. Coronavirus officially hitting the US. Israel's attack on Iran. These pop star Taylor Swift's concerts have generated... There's just so much being forced into our brains. It's not always explained well, and it's often overwhelmingly negative news. And we just simply... As Russia has unleashed war... ...turn off. More and more people are avoiding any bad news. A University of Canberra report says that almost 70% of people scroll past, change the channel, or don't click on distressing stories. This is Katerina Eva Matza from Pew Research Centre describing the news audiences turning away. Following news and accessing news and news consumption has been in decline. And the most prevalent of all this is young people. As you see here, adults of 18 to 29 are consistently lower than older adults in, in terms of news consumption. Right? And that trend has been declining. What she is describing in part is something called crisis fatigue. Crisis fatigue is something you may well have experienced during the height of the pandemic or through the news and information storms that come around major global events. It's that overwhelming feeling of all that has happened, all that could happen, the conjecture, the misery, the potential fear of the unknown, all compounding. And because of the way we consume media now, which is tailored to an audience of one, ourselves, by an algorithm, some people would rather avoid news altogether rather than consume what they need and disregard what they don't. Well, the data that's released this morning by C Copernicus says that globally it was the hottest summer ever. I hope you'll forgive me if I get emotional. Climate emergencies are not gender neutral. Oh my goodness, climate change isn't just going to kill us all. It's also sexist and misogynist. I knew it. You know, Australia is too small to do anything that will make any measurable change to the temperature and therefore to the climate. Now, when people look away, experts worry they fill up their brain's desire for information with low quality reporting or misinformation instead. Because of our fractured media environment, this has been accelerating with technology to the point where fewer people trust what they see. Global warming, that's the global warming you have to worry about. Not that the ocean's gonna rise in 400 years, an eighth of an inch, and you'll have more seafront property, right, if that happens. If the oceans rise, do you have more beachfront property? Does that make sense? If the oceans rise, do you have more beachfront or you have less, right? Further to this, more young people are increasingly turning exclusively to social media for their news. It's a place where there are few rules over what you can say or do to audiences. Last year, Boston University researchers analyzed over 22,000 tweets spreading climate disinformation. What they found was that more than 60 Twitter accounts that promoted false and misleading statements were funded by ExxonMobil, which just happens to be the world's largest publicly traded oil and gas company. While in 2021, it was revealed that 25 oil and gas industry organisations spent at least $9.5 million to place more than 25,000 ads on Facebook's US platforms for the last election, attempting to shape voting and policies around climate action. These ads were viewed more than 430 million times, and they made millions of dollars for Facebook for their part in platforming the campaign. In turn, this shapes and influences how people interact with climate news, with the outright denial that anything is wrong. In the US, Pew Research claims that 14% of Americans say there's no solid evidence that climate change is happening, while 34% admit it is important, but a low priority issue for politics to deal with. People who are in power, uh, and internationally, uh, notably, of course, the United States, but also in Australia, those voices are clearly heard. Um, and one hopes that the electorate will, will actually respond to those. Polarised politics also leads to an inability to fight climate change within our national dialogues. 
A Reuters Institute report showed that in Australia, there's a 36% difference in audience members' interest in climate change news, depending on which side of the political spectrum people claim to identify as being from. The further to the right people are, the less interest they show in climate news, claiming they dispute its impartiality. And researchers say on the other side of the aisle, the main reason for news avoidance is because audiences feel powerless and fatigued. These enormous media bodies are often also viewed through the lens of their owners' thoughts and views on climate politics. Do you think the net zero targets are achievable? Uh, and can Australia and other first world countries get the balance right between concerns for the environment and climate and maintaining a competitive economy and affordable energy? No, I think we're absolutely on the wrong track. I'm not a climate denier. I may be a skeptic of some of the things I've said. That was, of course, Rupert Murdoch. In Australia, his media entities have led the political fight against climate action within government. Unprecedented bushfires, unprecedented drought. No, this Australian summer has been the summer of unprecedented stupidity in relation to two of the most common and predictable occurrences in Australia's climate cycle, drought and bushfires. So with all of this shaping how climate news is broadcast, interpreted by audiences and processed in our communities, it seems we need a reset in the way information is shared about climate news. There's no simple solution. But Dr Lucy Richardson has a thought on how journalists like me could help shape the story. Um, one, one of the things that I think is really important to understand relates to how people process and remember information. We tend to focus on meaning and connections more than statistics. So they're, they're kind of mental shortcuts that are known as heuristics. And it has two key implications. First, we'll remember thing, that things are getting worse and they're getting worse fast, um, but not necessarily by how much or how soon. And those heuristics then inform our decisions and actions. Um, I think most people already have heuristics in mind that, that things are bad and getting worse but they may not have put these in place for the breadth of ways that these things will impact our lives. So by connecting these environmental changes with everyday concerns like food, health, jobs, et cetera, that people might not have made those connections with, we can start to actually stimulate new ways of thinking about the issue and new motivations for, for action at all levels. For example, did you know that some dogs will be at risk of heat stroke if they are being walked in temperatures even as low as 20 degrees? So if our cities are going to get warmer, what does that mean for our pets? And then, and secondly, when it comes to understanding causes and solutions, the mental connections that we make between our con concepts also influences our responses. And so many people don't truly understand the definitions behind the words that we see in the media on a regular basis, but they have mental shortcuts based on how those words are presented. So they might associate renewable energy as good and fossil fuels as bad. Um, and let's take the example of natural gas. So we're trained to think that natural means good. So our brains connect natural with good. Sorry, natural gas with good. Um, and all the debate in the media about the role of gas in our transition to renewable energy, that can actually make people's brains connect to gas and renewables, which are already tagged as good. And that doubly reinforces this heuristic, that, that mental shortcut. So when the government is faced with gas development proposals, People who have that heuristic in place may not realise the implications of the project from a climate change perspective, and that is a really critical issue. And in order to really tune into the issue, it's also really important for everyone to realise that climate change isn't an issue that's far away in the future affecting other people. It impacts us and our loved ones, and it's happening already. Here's Dr Jackie Brown from CSIRO one last time. There's a lot going on with climate change and you know, talking to my mum, she says, oh, I don't have to worry about climate change. I'll be dead before that happens. But the reality is climate change is happening now and it's going to get more intense over the next 20 years. So we need to be taking this really seriously. We're already seeing the effects of bushfires, flooding, marine heat waves, or even you know the daily heat waves through summer, particularly in the big cities. They'll keep happening. They'll keep happening more frequently. Sometimes it can seem like climate change is not going to be so bad. Oh, it'll just be a little bit warmer or it'll rain a bit heavier. It won't affect me. But there's a lot of flow-on effects that we're still actually understanding as we see these extreme events happen. The increased temperatures and rainfall and droughts and floods, that will affect the sort of food we can grow in Australia and how much that food costs. 
it will affect our insurance premiums. It will affect health, particularly for the elderly, elderly with the uh, heat waves coming through, our transport, how we get around, our energy costs, even where we go on holiday. So I think we're still getting our head around just what the world will be in 20 years and how we'll navigate it. That's it for this episode of Leave It to the Experts. For more on our coverage of the State of the Climate Report, including climate impacts on Australia's snowfall and the threat to reef and fish populations, head to 360info.org. There you can also sign up for our newsletters and newswire for journalists and understand our work to fight against climate change with university experts worldwide. This episode of Leave It to the Experts was produced by Michael Joyner, Lachlan Gazelli and Grace Jennings Edquist. Music by Jan Skubi-Skeski at Red Moon Studios. I'm your host, Grace Jennings Edquist. See you next time.